All right, everybody, stay ready. Real estate meets small acts communities. Me and Emeka, we're back. We're talking, we're chatting, we're hanging out. Hey guys, it's your boy Nico here from the Small Axe Podcast. I want to show you how to use your small axe to build a lasting empire. You see, not everybody begins their investing career with millions of dollars, a huge network of investors, or the knowledge necessary to become successful in this space. And that's okay. What I focus on here on this podcast is helping you hone your skills, sharpen your tools to become the best investor that you can be. Now, I want you to sit back, relax, and enjoy this show. If you have any questions or you want to reach out to me or the guest, feel free to do so. Love you guys. What's going on, Nico? Last time was great, so we got to keep doing this. And I guess we could just talk about it, but let's talk about literally what it takes to get into a deal. When I first got into multifamily, Nico, I, I don't... No exaggeration. I read um, The Hands-Off Investor by Brian Burke, and it basically gave a blueprint of what a passive investor should be looking for. So from the reverse end, I was like, I can do this all by myself. I have the, I have the answers. And before I like settled out in Central Florida, I literally looked at like 10 different states. I was like, I'm going to underwrite all of them. Uh, you know, I'm going to build a relationship with all these brokers from all these six different states. I quickly realized that no broker took me seriously and that was just way too much. So I'll talk about a little bit about like what you do and how like how much you're doing to build these relationships with brokers. Well, yeah, totally. So if if we had millions of dollars, this would be a no brainer. We just go in, we'd use our millions of dollars and and a broker would treat us like, you know, a, a real customer. Uh, but we don't have that luxury. And most of the people that I know don't have that luxury. They might have a few hundred thousand, uh, but it's not enough to buy a real multifamily deal. So we rely on relationships with our network, with friends, families, partners, and investors that we are going to get to invest in these deals to show as proof. So it's hard for us to get into a deal if we have no proof of concept, no experience, no money, or or little money, right? Or little means of putting together a team that has enough money to close on a multi-million dollar deal. So it took me three years to get my own deal. And I was not, it wasn't like three years of me sitting around, you know, say, talking to a broker every, every couple of months. It was more like me talking to everybody every single day, all day, focusing exclusively on one market and doing it day in and day out nonstop. And still it took me three plus years. Oh, for sure. And you're in New York, too. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, that aspect of it. Like, number one, like whenever you're doing these initial emails or calls and they know that you're in New York, what what is the conversation? I know you have deals in Lakeland now and you have deals in Florida now. Whenever you initially started, how hard was it for you to, you know, really get a good deal going or a pocket listing? Today is much different than it was four and a half years ago when I started. So uh, almost five years now. So anyway, when I first started, I flew down right away. As soon as I began my journey, it was within a week or so. I, I went to the uh, boot camp with Jake and Gino. And then two weeks after that, I flew down to Florida to talk with brokers and meet with brokers. And I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. I told, I'll, I'll never forget it. This conversation, I sat down with this broker, D. D. Moret, I was actually on the phone with him this weekend. He does industrial now. He doesn't do multifamily, but we keep in touch. And he's passing me off to one of his uh, colleagues that does um, RV parks, as me and you have been discussing recently. And I have a call with her next week. But my first conversation with him, he's, he asked me, what ca cap rate am I looking for? And I said, at least an eight cap. And he laughed at me because at that point in Tampa, this was 2019, he was like, no, there's no way you're going to get an eight cap in Tampa. He goes, unless you're, unless you're going to go way outside of Tampa and it's going to be D-class property or a mobile home park or something like that. And he laughed at me. And I didn't know what I was talking about. I didn't know. Like I had the energy, the enthusiasm to go down there and do this and meet with people and show that and, and say that I am a multifamily investor. And I just didn't have the vocabulary or the knowledge of the expertise at that point. No, it's, it's funny because I was doing like the... Uh 
the flashcards or like at least <laughs> I get in my spiral, I get the, the I have like the words at the top and then I try to be like, okay, yield maintenance. Uh, go to the back. Oh, I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it's a lot of information to take in. And I, I think it just really goes into the fact that you can't do this alone. You know, some people try to do it alone, but it takes, you know, a lot longer, right? We're just talking about the underwriting and the broker relationships, right? The capital raising and the funding and the term. There's so much that really goes into it where I think some people are, are learning that, you know, you just experience matters, right? You know, there's these 20 to 30 year olds who are trying to knock down deals in, uh, during the COVID times when they've never experienced a down cycle. And that's where, you know, true real underwriting who with someone like yourself who does it daily and is slightly crazy and talks to brokers on a consistent basis, that's where it goes in hand. If you're really just trying to, if you're trying to call yourself an investor and you're doing, you're underwriting one deal every month, that might be progress, but you're not going to be competitive in the competitive markets like Florida. Totally, man. It's crazy. I would never want to, like, I try to think about my competition and, and this really struck a chord with me when I, it was my first year and I was listening to Hadar talk and I've recorded this and, and um, it was like a meetup that I did and I recorded it and everything that he was doing, I said, oh my God, if this guy was my competition, I wouldn't get a deal. There was no way that I would get a deal based on what he was doing. But back to the, the conversations with brokers, my conversation yesterday and today even, which I emailed you about, but yesterday was completely different than what it was four and a half years ago. So yesterday I got on a call with uh, two guys from Collier's, great brokers, and they spent one full hour with me reviewing all of our deals. And they, they, they actually, they took the time for, to set up like all this analysis and these OMs essentially as if they were going to sell the properties or present them to, um, to like as pocket listings for all the properties. And they went through, they spent all this time with me and energy reaching out to me i didn't reach out to them they want and and when they did the analysis they, they were trying to find comps and they were like it looks like you guys own all the comps and we are at the top of the market so, <laughs> yeah they were and they were so impressed with the deal that we did at idlewild and how we negotiated those terms and, and they were like this is a killer deal i can't believe it etc and they have us on the radar now this is your boy luis uh, he's got us on the radar now for um for River, Riverview Apartments, the 14 unit, there are some serious issues that they're, they're trying to clear up and we can't buy it as is, unfortunately, but we are definitely on that radar. So my conversations today are twofold. Number one, my experience is way beyond what it was. And then number two, the market shifted for sure. Now brokers are contacting us. Well, for sure. And then, I, I mean, not to toot my own horn and toot, you know, Mark and Anton's horn, but um, we can get to the deal quick too. So not only like, you are the reliable one, right? Like they're looking at your numbers, you're talking to with the underwriting, you're the ones who are setting up these deals. Well, they they have someone else to go to down here quick and visit these places and also meet different aspects of the team. And then they can hear the legit in our voices, right? Like Mark, for an example, he's the property manager, right? You know, these brokers are seeing like, oh my gosh, okay, they really have a full team. You know, he, Mark, manages hundreds of properties around the area, and he really knows what he's talking about. You know, I've actually gotten to the point where I know what I'm talking about, too, where I can say, hey, like, this is not normal. Why don't we have this information? People don't have all the information, but whenever I'm asking certain questions of information that they probably hope they don't ask for, it, it, it seems that they remember it. And, you know, one little thing that kind of stuck out to me as well is we were visiting a 12-unit, I think, um, somewhere out here in Central Florida, and me and Mark were taking off our shoes before we entered the property. And the broker's like, oh my gosh, like this has never happened before. And I'm like, I mean, it's, we're just walking. <laughs> it was raining. Like we're, it's raining, we're walking in dirt and grass and like he was flabbergasted. And that's when like he, he sent us another like 33 unit off market deal. So, you know, gaining a rapport with these brokers as well as proving yourself seems to seems to always work. And it took you three years to do. I had the, the luxury of having you. So I didn't have to, you know, battle three years to build that relationship. Yeah, well, uh, so it's very different. I, did, I mean, I did get into a deal. It was one year after my journey started to the day almost that I closed on my first deal. 
but that was very different. I didn't find the deal. I didn't lock it up. It was just a group of guys that I was friends with in our community that needed help uh, with the capital raise and, and some stuff on the, on the investor relations. So I got into that deal that way, but it, it wasn't, you know, you're not going to get any, any traction with brokers if you don't close deals like that. So, and, and it's that actually helped me and springboarded me into my first deal because we actually sold that 18 months later. And when selling it, I was talking, because I, I, I find any excuse or reason or conversation to bring up with brokers. And I reached out to all the brokers and this conversation was, hey, we're selling our 194 unit property in Columbus, Ohio, looking for something quick. And that's exactly when I got that 44 unit of the contract because they saw it as somebody that, all right, I have money ready to go. When in reality, I didn't, it was just, I had to raise from, you know, from my network. It's strategy, right? I, I like to go everything in with strategy, right? Why am I talking to this person? What am I trying to get out of them? I'm not trying to use anybody, but what's one of the number one things that we're taught, right? What value do we have? Can we bring? So in every conversation I'm having with people, in the back of my head, I'm trying to figure out what value I can have or what strategy can I do to one-up me or better my future. And it sounds like that's exactly what you did with, you know, letting them know, hey, like I'm selling 140 units. Right. If you went to them and told them you're selling a house, they don't care. But now you sent them, oh, sh like, oh, poop. Right. He, he has 140 units to sell. He's a big player. Even if you're not, it looks like it. And that's when you got the 44 unit deal. If you can give two or three actionable things that someone can do right now today, what would you say for them to get started or to better their um, multifamily investing career? Yeah, absolutely. I love this question. Think about your current financial position. If you have a shit ton of money, excuse me, if you have a lot of money, <laughs> that's you're in. You're in any team. You're, you, know, you don't even have to be a nice guy. You can probably be on any team. You could probably do a deal by yourself. Think about your financial resources. If you have zero money, if you have a few hundred thousand, right? There's all strategies of getting involved depending on how much financial resources you have. That's number one. And I, I, you know, we can go deep into that, what you can do with little, with no little to no money, 50,000, hundred thousand or millions. And then number two, I want you to think, I want our listeners to think about what um, time do you have to put into this? This is not something that you, let's say, this is not mailbox money. You're not buying, you're not, all of a sudden I like this property. I found it on, on LoopNet. I'm going to pay what the asking price is. I'm not even going to do much research or homework. I closed in 45 days with this money and I don't even look at the property. I have a third party property manager and that's it. If you're thinking like that, you are not going to be successful. You have to put in hours and hours every single day, even if you're working a W-2. So number one, what is your time uh, like? How much time do you have? Number two, how much financial resources do you have? And you have to have the enthusiasm, number three, enthusiasm and willingness and patience to be in this for the long run because this is a long game i would say the most overlooked thing that you said is time right if you can count the amount of hours and minutes that you spent you, man, it's insane even the hours that i spend I, my role is completely different that's insane right i have to really like time the time at the time when with my w2 my meetings you know my calls my teams at the time okay well it might take an hour hour and a half to get this place what can I do while I'm getting there, right? You know, be safe, of course, but that's an hour and a half that I may lose if I'm, you know, with family or work or anything like that. Obviously, the W-2 comes first, but if I can, um, any 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 time, any second I can squeeze to better myself when it comes to that real estate, it's, it, it's gonna, it, it adds up, it's gonna help over time. And no, I appreciate you saying those three, those three things. And the enthusiasm as well is huge. It's huge. I, we get excited for every deal. We get excited about the momentum. And I mean, that's, that's what we're looking for, right? We're here to have fun. We're not here to make it, you know, boring or get depressed every time, you know, a deal doesn't work out because for every deal that we get, we probably have to go 300 deals. So every no is one closer to a yes. So every no should still be excitement because that's momentum and, you know, that's going to make us closer to that next deal. Yeah. And we're learning together, man. And your job and your role is so awesome. And I would recommend it for a lot of people, uh, but not everybody, right? Because you do a lot of work and it goes unnoticed. A lot of times it goes unpaid, right? And, and you're driving to all these places. 
and I try to limit how much I, I send you, how many trips I send you on, even if it's a drive by, because it's, it does take a lot of your time, energy and money because you're spending money on gas and, and driving around in time, which is super valuable, but you are, are very good at what you do. And I really appreciate it. And um, you've even sent me, so like, this is a tip for people out there. What Emeka does is he will get video, obviously drive around the neighborhood, uh, take videos, take pictures. He'll get out of his car and he'll walk around the, the property with <laughs> and pictures. And if he stumbles upon a resident, he will have his phone on and, and have a conversation, sometimes get some of that conversation on recording and, and we can all listen to it and see what the tenants and residents think of the property, which is huge, man. Oh, yeah. And, you know, obviously be careful with that. I've been, there's neighborhoods that are tougher than others. So you just got to be strategic. Like I said, I do everything with a purpose. And, you know, if I go out to a property, I mean, if it's an hour, an hour and a half away, I'm not going to go there every other day, right? It just doesn't make sense. So, and you'll learn that tenants will tell you literally everything that's going to be beneficial for us because it's not their property. They don't care if they talk crap on it. They don't take, they don't care if they say their best things. They're gonna let us know what's going around the neighborhood, who shot who, um, you know, who cooks what, whose family members, this and that. They don't care. In their eyes, I'm some random person on the property who may be looking to rent. I might be, you know, a security guy one day. I'm, I might be an actor one day. Who knows? You gotta do what you can to secret shop and get as much information that might be beneficial. And I don't feel bad about it because you're going to learn that selling brokers are never going to tell you everything that you need to hear. It's just how it is. So. It's the truth. I mean, the broker's job is really to push the price as high as possible, which I totally respect and I get that. But I, I it's rare that I ever find a deal and I say, yes, this is the price point that I wanted at. Um, just because we underwrite very differently and especially in a syndication, if we are going to syndicate, there are different fees that go into it than a typical acquisition and the brokers don't account for it. Number one is the acquisition fee, which is typically 2% of the purchase price, which means we can't offer as high as somebody else who doesn't have an acquisition fee. Number two is an asset management fee, but our team has been not, we've been dropping that just to push all the cash flow to our investors. And then uh, the brokers don't necessarily underwrite all of them, underwrite for having a CapEx budget, having reserves in the bank and all of this extra money that we need to come up with dilutes the returns for our investors, which means we just can't offer as much as somebody else who's, let's say, going in with a 1031 exchange or a JV partnership even. So we're a little bit at a disadvantage unless we can find secret ways to make the deal better that other people just don't see. Mic drop. <laughs> that was good, Nico. That was great. We got we to gotta keep doing this. We got to keep it going on. And we got to no, we got to go here shortly, but... Um, but yeah, honestly, we're going to keep bringing it on. I hope you, we love this. Nico, got any last words? Just want to say, guys, uh, uh, make sure you know what you're getting into. This is, as Emeka says, this is really a, a game that takes a lot of time, energy, and money. If you're not that into it, not that interested in it, and don't have the time or the resources, uh, just be a, a limited partner. But if you do, reach out to us and we can help you through your journey. We love helping people. Right now, it's for free, guys. We just talk to people all day, every day and we help people along however we can. Mm -hmm. no, reach out to us for free while it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right, time. Nico, until next time. Got to <laughs> keep using my small axe. That's right. Stay ready, my man. <laughs> All right. Hey, Small Axe community. I would like to say thank you for listening to another episode of my podcast, where we show you how to use your small axe to build a lasting empire. Now, if you liked what you heard, it would mean the world to me if you would subscribe, leave a five-star rating, and write a review. Also, if you want to get in touch with me, go to my website at smallaxecommunities.com. Book a call with me. And until the next episode, keep sharpening those axes.